or co-directors or anybody that has TEDx UCSD written in their name and we will ask those questions for you. Um, today we have Victor Ochoa with us and I wanted to give a little bit of a brief on Victor and his talk. So Victor's talk was about his life as a Chicano dealing with the issues on the most traveled border in the world. From his childhood to right now, immigration has been going on through four generations of his situation from his family to him to his community. And he glosses over the civil rights movements of the 60s and 70s, which influenced him, his art and his activism. It made him feel like a surfer riding the tsunami of activism. And after more than 50 years of work, he feels the same energy and creativity to produce murals and work that battle these Chicano issues. And I think Mo Monica has a question to start us off. All and right. if y'all. <laughs> Thank you, Yushi, for that talk description. To start us off, let's ask Victor his first question. Victor, can you talk us through your process of creating your talk? What was it like? And what was the inspiration for your talk? Well, it was very helpful to go through that Zoom practice, I think, that we did um, last week or something. But I, I would like to mention my team was um, Cindy Rocha and um, Inigis, a, a camera person that, that uh, used actually two cameras, and he was wondering why we didn't take advantage of that. But uh, anyway, uh, I, I like to give credit to both of them to helping me. And they were almost like co-directing me with the, the list. And it was really, really great to, it was easy. It was a lot easier that way for me. So your talk is titled Chicanosaurus at the Border. And what does the word Chicanosaurus mean to you? I remember in our speakers workshops, you were very. Yeah, it's a term that was actually uh, uh, kind of came through Rene Yanez, the director of, uh, that just passed away a couple of years ago, uh, uh, the Galeria de la Raza and the mission in San Francisco. And here goes, I was with another person that was overweight and we were walking the streets of the mission and they, he was approaching us and he goes, there comes the Chicano dinosaurs. Because I guess you could tell, because everybody in San Francisco seems all slim and athletic and everything and so we were we really kind of felt out of place a little bit but i i got sh shocked a little bit for the term but then i as i thought about it my sense of pride came up and i says hell yeah i'm still a, a chicano and i'm still a uh, hard-headed you know i think you got to be kind of hard-headed because a lot of people feel disappointed that a lot of the movements from the 60s and the 70s are kind of quenching down or you, you don't hear that much about them but I see movements like cycles and a lot of times I see the younger generations really surge and and really come up and so it's um that is part of pride and still being you know um oriented to those issues it seems like the issues don't do not go away <laughs> sorry all right we have a question here from the audience member, Coco. Did you have any moments where you wanted to give up on your career as an artist or muralist? Or in other words, what are some of your lowest points in your career? You know, I'm so used to working with negativity and, and, and low points, you know, like today we're working with Anastasio's murder at the border and in trying to take turn it around to something positive i'm so used to something down that to turn it around to something positive and uh, I, I actually can't remember uh any time where i felt that you know i mean maybe the death of my mother three years ago was sort of down but even that emotional down it's still, I was still doing watercolors and, you know, just, I, you know, work, my work is just part of life. You know, art is life. And so it's, you know, I don't know. It, I, I, even my tax person says everything I do 
it's art and tax related. So you can buy, you know, buy cable TV and that's part of my career, sort of. It's, everything is, is part of it. That's really cool, taking negative and then turning into positive. So it doesn't, yeah, that's, that's very interesting. We have another question from Juan. He asks, what does Chicano mean to you and what facets of your identity make you Chicano? <laughs> I think I know who that Juan is. <laughs> from one of the machistas from Mesa College. Uh, we've been Whoa. discussing that. Um, you know, um, I like it not to be confusing to, especially new audiences that, that never use it or don't recognize it or or don't understand it. And so people go, there's a lot of different definitions. Uh, from, even from Mexico, I, I know when I last was in DF, he says, oh, you Chicanos don't, don't want to be known as Mexicans. That's why you're, you're changing. And, and that's completely um, not true because we are proud of being Mexicans, but we have this attitude. And to me, Chicano means uh, somebody with a political attitude and it has you know it's issue oriented so try to keep it simple and then people start thinking well do i have an issue about racism do i have an issue about immigration do i have an issue about police brutality do i have a, a issue about by you know just knowing my indigenous heritage you know so once they find out what the issues are then everybody says oh i'm chicano too you know, it's like that I try to be more inclusive and try to make it easier for the future generations. And the Chicano movement is sort of a cycle, you know, it is, it, you know, you know, a lot of the, you know, women's liberation is, where is that at? You know, is it dormant or does it activate when the president says something against women, you know, or, or what, you know, it's, it, it's sometimes it's a reactionary thing. And I did, was there a two part of Juan's question? I, 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 yes, what makes you Chicano? I think, well, of course that I have that attitude and that <clears throat> I think that also activism has something to do with it and, and that you're gonna do something about it. And, and you don't have to be out on the streets like I am, I'm painting murals on the streets at, so I get it. I get like uh, real racist people go back to Mexico where you belong. Cars driving by, or like the other night. Oh man, you're painting a Che Cafe at UCSD. I graduated from there in 19, in 2017, and this was the most human place on all campus. And I go, all right. It was like nine o'clock at night when we're projecting. I go, wow, you know, it's um, it's uh, really good to feel that uh, warmth. Oh, uh, and um, I, you know, I just, I just completely identify with the term. It, the term it, itself has a pre-Columbian root to it, so it has that heritage of the Aztecs and in, in Nahuatl language. And um, and then it was a, it's always been kind of a derogatory term, like for my parents and before, because being Indian, let's face it is not been a positive thing. And we kind of turned it around and said, we, we love the fact that we are indigenous and we have that heritage. So um, I think um, that's uh, part of it. I mean, it's, it's, then later on it can be complex, but I try to make it simple. That's really cool. That's, that's very interesting. Um, another question I have, oh, go on, Monica. Oh. Thank you, Juan, for his question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Juan. <laughs> uh, another question I have for you is, based on the murals, you mentioned how you're painting at the Che Cafe right now. So what's the hardest part? What are the challenges of creating a mural? Well, I just feel so, uh, it's almost like a genetic tie that I have with murals. You know, I, I know the first time I painted a mural, which is so amazing that I touched the wall and the vibrations on the wall was like prehistoric. I, I, I remember because I, I re remember reading uh, a cave muralist 
blow, chewing the pigment in his mouth and then putting his hand on the kid and blowing the silhouette of his hand on there to show that he had been there. And that just caused me to say, what is the reason why we paint on the walls? As my grandson just scribbled on the bedroom wall yesterday, I go, and it, it, it gave me pleasure to see him do that. And, you know, there's the Aztecs and the Mayas and the Zapotecas. Everybody painted murals with colors and pigments. And, and then, of course, the Mexican muralists. So, I don't know. It just, it, it's so much of a pleasure and a love that it doesn't, you know, I mean, now that I'm getting older, I always ask people to help me carry things. And so, I mean, that, that could be a hard point. My... I have no more cartilage on my shoulder because, you know, after 50 years of doing these movements, you know, you know, the, the what do you call that, the MRI, I said, Mr. Ochoa, you don't have any more cartilage. So um, it hurts. And sometimes I have to adjust where I'm standing a little bit. And sometimes I ask somebody, hey, can you fill that area up there for me? Because I, I can't reach it. And, that's why my scaffolding are pretty elaborate. And uh, physically, I, I can see climbing up seven stories. Right now, the mural that I'm painting is seven stories high. So it's kind of my exercise now that I go up and down, and then I do my stretches on the arm rails and stuff like that. But um, conceptual, Conceptualizing things sometimes can be complex, and especially if I work with a team, I like to work with uh, the community uh, people, even the widow, I have input into Anastasio's mural because we all interviewed her and spoke, uh, asked her questions and things. Um, so, I mean, but it's not complex. I mean, it's not hard for me. It just, I think it's part of the, I guess the richness of doing a mural is to, to be inclusive and to, um, get into this dimension of speaking out to the community, be responsible to the community because murals are not like gallery art. They're just usually elite people. The Mexican community rarely goes to galleries, by the way. And so I, I kind of reject the gallery scene a little bit, but murals are responsible to the whole community, to everybody that passes by. And, and we don't have access to our history or books or different even the media doesn't represent us so murals sort of act as that you know part of communication that's very cool oh go on monica <laughs> thank you victor i'm sure we can all relate to at least having one drawing on the wall when we were growing up and like as you said having a wall um having a mural on the wall is very like it is in your face, like you get that message straight up. But to move on, we have a question from the audience member, um, Salahuddin, I will unmute you and you can ask your question. Hey, Victor, um, I was just curious as to which mural was your favorite one? Which one did you connect to the most and why? Yeah, I often get that, that question and um, I've painted so many hundreds of murals. So there's certain things that I like about some, some more than others. And then I also feel kind of interested in how the public reacts to different ones. You know, there's a facade of the Centro Cultural de la Raza in Baboa Park that because I have an, a Geronimo with a gun in right on Park Boulevard, I get a lot of feedback, and then now that they understand it, that they know that I'm Yaki, which is very similar to Apache, um, they understand it uh, and they appreciate it more. But, you know, the All the Way to the Bay mural is getting a lot of international feedback because uh, we have gained uh, 2.3 acres at the Bay it's one of the largest murals. It's a dual mural in the way it, it's placed in the park from the, from the bandstand. It, it really has this optical perspective 
this really strong, but I, I have a lot of favorites. There's the, the historical mural that we first did in 1973, um, the Mexican Revolution mural of, that I did with all airbrush is also one of my favorites. Um, but I connect with all of them and, and I, you know, there's, um, and when I'm painting murals, I, I keep on cooking them until I feel a certain amount of satisfaction. It's like cooking a big olla de menudo and you put the, like I just spiked up mine with a lot of oregano because it's an antiviral. <laughs> so, you know, if you're putting these spices and you're cooking, cooking them up till, till you, you get the flavor that you really want. That's so cool. It's so hard to pick a personal favorite just because I feel like you put so much effort into all of them that it's like asking you who your favorite child is. I don't right. have children, but I'm sure someone can relate in the audience. And there's, some, there's some things that you really love about them and some you you question some of their, their attitudes and perspectives, but you still love them, you know, still. Exactly, exactly. So thank you for your question, Saladin. Um, Jim sent me a question. Um, they asked, give me one second. If you would like to unmute yourself, Jim, you can ask the question, but give me a second to find it. Oh, okay, so where can we, uh, is there a place we can buy your art or do you only do murals? Um, that's a other question that I get a lot. I'm, I guess I'm kind of like a communist in a certain way because money and art kind of have a disconnection for me. I, I paint, and I get asked, can we have some of those in the gallery for sale? And I'm like, oh my God, it, I have sold paintings, but it's almost like selling your child. And then you wonder, where is it? Is it in a good place? Is it, is the sun hitting it? Is, you know, um, so I'm not a very good salesman and um, I love to exhibit in, in in galleries, but um, um, it's very difficult. I've been doing Instagram for a couple of years. And so what I thought about Instagram, mural, by the way, it's murals, plural, Ochoa, um, where I would put all my artwork so that people could see the different things that I do, because I don't just do murals. I do watercolors, I do silkscreen prints, I do pen and ink, I do, almost every technique you can think of. I, I use sponges, I use, and I also paint abstract. I, um, I love to do abstract. I've been doing abstract paintings since the 60s. And I also include very experimental uh, layering and transparencies on my murals. It have to make, it has to be fun to me to do. It has to be somewhat experimental because I get bored easy. And, and I love to, oh, I love textures. So I slop on just all kinds of stuff on my canvases because when it's all smooth and everything, it just, you know, even that's boring to me is, you know, and I love to do a portrait on paint that I spilled on there and used a rake to have, you know, it seemed more interesting to have a, a little bit of texture in there too. That's very cool. Um, that's amazing that even the way you try to quote unquote sell your art is very community focused as aligns with your activism. Vibob in the audience has a question, so I will unmute you, Vibob. Go ahead and ask. Hi, Victor. Uh, thank you so much for the Q&A. But uh, my question was, I've been, I've been actually taking a uh, politics of Mexico class and we learned about post-revolutionary Mexico and how muralism was a really big part of telling the story and being you know talking about history so for you how do you how important do you think art is for educating people uh, about history and about um, I guess monumental things you know happening in our life well like I was saying earlier right I get got influenced a lot by the Mexican muralists and they were social political artists and got criticized quite a bit from the art establishment thinking that, oh, art is only aesthetics 
and beauty in that. And, and uh, Diego Rivera would respond, well, if we have a big population of illiterate people, how do we get that, you know, how do we educate them to what what's going on? And of course they were during the, the revolution, they, Diego Rivera from 1890s to the, you know, the whole early 19s, you know, 1900s, they were all painting. And so uh, Chicanos, we kind of took the torch from that and, and activated with murals to educate the community about those issues. So it was, it's always been very important to me. And now that we're a national landmark, you see all these different generations after in 50 years coming through and learning some things about, about our history, uh, but also pride of being in a place that, that has that energy. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, we don't get educated on how to to see art or appreciate art. So it's one of those things that this society really, you know, it's really a learning process to go to Chicano Park. You, you don't really understand all the, the symbols in that. Um, there was a portrait of Benito Juarez there last week and somebody asked me, well, who's that guy with the tuxedo? And so I figured that everybody knew the first Indian president. So I, 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 I realized that more names and then online try to to explain more more to people that are sort of illiterate visually. So it's um you know it um, it's very important. I'm kind of an archivist, but then at the same time, I all of these images I I'm, I keep on putting them on my Facebook. I invite people to look at my Facebook because I continuously put what I'm working on or what things are happening in, in mural public art or um, just culture in general, not only in San Diego, but because I'm in communication with Cuba, I'm, I painted a mural in Belfast with the IRA. They're, they're, they're interested in coming and doing a, a Belfast Irish uh, mural at the park and one of the breweries that we have in Logan Heights is Irish. And so they want to actually do a parade festivity, Mexicano, San Patricio's Irish, uh, you know, dynamic. So I'm kind of looking forward to that. We'll have a wee pint. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's really cool. And I think having, well, firstly, thank you for your question, Viva. And I think using murals as a way to educate is such a cool um, idea. And I hadn't ever thought about that till you mentioned it. So it's something that's now like in the back of my head. Um, yeah, it's very cool. We have a question from Carissa. She asks, in your talk, you mentioned how you had a bit more knowledge about Mexican history than your peers did in school. Why do you think that it's important for us as Chicanix to know more than just the surface level of our country's history? And how can we better instill that sense of Chicano pride in younger generations? Well, that's very important to me. I, I think I actually thank immigration for kicking me, kicking my family back to Mexico. And uh, my teachers that I had during that particular time of the 50s and 60s, they were very progressive in Mexico and they were always questioning the global uh, things that were going on. And um, so not only did they teach us uh, Mexican history, the thing is that they don't, they don't teach you anything about Mexico in the United States. They, they'll talk about, I think I saw in a university book, Diego Rivera, and then I saw Cesar Chavez in a high school social uh, studies book, and, and that's about it. So um, I had all this historical knowledge when, when it was, uh, like for instance, the women were saying, well, you need to have more women on that mural. And, uh, so I, you know, I, I knew a lot of uh, important women in Mexican history, and most of the Chicanos that I was with, they, when I said Josefina Ortiz de Dominguez, everybody's like looking at me. Oh, there's there's that pollo again, or uh, Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz. I remember 
uh, people said, uh, you know, so we, you know, I think as a muralist, we, we always have to be researching our issues, but um, I already had that pride of the history, you know, I, right away when they said uh, Pancho Villa was a bandit when I was in seventh grade, I said, I'm sorry, he's a national hero. You, you guys are whack. You, you, you don't know, you don't know what you're talking about. And um, so that is, was, has been very important to me. And then I uh, been doing more and more research. My grandfather gave me a lot, you know, uh, Mexico a través de los siglos, uh, Mexico throughout the, the centuries, because he knew that I was interested in that. And he was an archivist as well. Um, and I think that second part of your question was, um, what was that second part? Um, and I kind of went Why on. do you think it's important for us to know more than our surface level history of our own country? And how can we instill that sense of pride in the next generation? Yeah, you know, that reminds me of uh, Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera. Um, Madonna bought, uh, uh, you know, Frida Kahlo, three pieces, I forget, it's been 15 years or so or more, uh, for $9 million. So she was actually the, the highest selling Latino, Latina in history to sell her work. So then somebody said, oh, she's more important than Diego. And then they, they seconded by saying, oh, you have to know the history of Mexico to understand Diego Rivera's murals. And I'm going, you know, it, it, it was like, um, I can actually call the movement that's going on about Frida Kahlo, Freditis, because it, you know, she means something. She's, she's a strong woman and a lot of her paintings were more than narcissistic. I think because of her ailments and all that, she was very much as an individual. So is, is it more international to be a narcissist or is it more international to know and represent your history of your country? So, the, you know, uh, I say that Diego Rivera is more important globally than, you know, uh, you know, the individual. And how, why is it more important? I think, you know, a lot of us that have been introducing ourselves realize their history. I love Juan saying that he's Kumiai and, and he sounds like he's proud of it. The more knowledge that he acquires about that, makes him a stronger individual. So I think it's very important for us to know where we come from and, oh, I, I lived 16 years in this this place. What was that, the island? I forget. Uh, somebody was saying uh, that they had been there since high school and then they came came to, to the United States. You know, um, no, I, I think it's very important, especially if you feel inferior because you're darker or different looking because I know uh, one of the Filipinas were saying, oh, I'm lighter. But as I look at her, as her facial structure, she looks Filipina. That's, I think, uh, was that you, Monica? I think somebody said that they were lighter. In that was our co-director, Annika. Annika, oh, that, over there? <laughs> yeah, you're a güerita, but you still look, you know, look at that. Look at those the cheekbones and everything. That's it. You know, the, you know. Skin color is sometimes de deceptive. That's correct, Victor. You raised really interesting points about like having pride because how how can you stand up tall without knowing your own foundations? Um, I will throw the mic to Christine to ask her question. I will unmute you right now, Christine. Please ask your question. Also, thank you, Carissa, for yours. Yes. Thank, thank you, you Carissa. So hi, thank you. First a compliment and then a question. So my son's name is Victor, and when I saw you on the opening reception uh, and, and what you had to say was uh, so engaging, I thought, oh, I'm going to look Victor up after this and maybe we can be friends. So without any introduction, I thought you were a cool guy. Then I realized you're one of the featured speakers and like, oh, I know your art and you're famous. So, <laughs> But my question for you is, you know, during the pandemic, but even before, sometimes we have periods where we feel down, where our energy is low. 
And if you've ever experienced that, how do you re-energize or reboot yourself? Well, I think that was similar to a question that I just got, but um, even though I was 70 days in quarantine without painting murals, that I still had a lot of stuff to do. I'm kind of an archivist, so on one computer, I have 26,000 images that I'm trying to organize, and I've been using this old Picasso thing to, to organize them, and uh, kind of obsolete now, and, but uh, I'm still using it and trying to save those images. I'm also in the archives at UC Santa Barbara, and I was, uh, I've been sending um, my work, um, videos, a lot of those things. So I have actually a lot of stuff to do. I actually live with my grandson and my son. And so that's, that kept me kind of uh, inspired in life and, and that. And so I, I think in a nutshell to, I never feel down. I, I, I kind of, you know, it's, it's strange, you know, that um, I, I always see even the most negative crap that I see about immigration. That when I even saw the image of the kids in the cages at the border, I, I turned. I, I'm used to turning that negativity into something positive, creative, colorful, and uh, onto the murals. So. I, it seems like I have a digestive system that turns crap into beauty. You know, it's kind of one of those. It's it's uh, it's uh, being a Chicano is being you know you gotta you, to survive. You gotta in, instead of internalizing. You know, my mom always said, "Oh, there's mucha te." You know, uh, you know, like don't hold in. You know, your frustrations and your your pains. Push it out. So. Now, from being an introverted kid, now you can't stop me talking, you know, it's like, you know, so. <laughs> Thank you. That's, Take that's very cool. <laughs> and I like the idea, I love the idea of taking negative and turning into positive and learning from it, growing from it. That's so cool. Also, what you mentioned about still doing art, even though you can't paint murals on a big mural anymore, you can still do it in smaller ways. You can still keep your passion going, find different ways to do that. So that was very cool. Thank you, Christine, for your question and Victor for your answer. Um, and our co-director, our resident co-director had a question. So I'm gonna turn the mic over to her. Yes, hi, Victor. My question is, um, can you walk us through your process of creating a mural from concept generation to actually putting it up on the wall, like where your inspiration comes from, what you decide to paint, things like that. Well, there, you know, there seem to be the, the, the kind of like top seven issues that's, that I deal with. So, you know, there's so many things that surround that. Um, like recent times, there's been um, like the knowledge of lowriders, for instance, and, and how they are part of our culture. And, uh, um, and the, you know, we've been using lowriders in our marches since the 60s. And um, so whatever the issue or the topic is, um, if I have, especially if I have a group, uh, it's the conceptual, the theme, theme development part that I, that I call is um, something that I'd like to use as a group. And so I like to put a group together and then we have discussions and, and I ask everybody to participate into the theme development because I don't want it just to be a Victor Ochoa mural. I want it to be more of a community mural. So everybody has input. Even when I do a kid's mural, the kids, I ask them, okay, well, would you like to see on the mural? And, and so I remember this one kid said, oh, my, my grandmother was, lived here and, and she did this at the cannery. And, and, and that is, says, oh, great. That sounds very interesting. And in historical so would you like to have a picture of your grandmother and she he says oh bro bring next time we meet bring a picture of your grandma and um we put it on the mural and so that made that kid really really uh, vested interest into it and and now i have a little a little projector 
and I did that in Cuba the last time. I took the photograph of the kid and then put it in the projector at night, and here we are on top of the scaffolding, projected her own image on there, and she drew it on and painted it the next day. And so um, um, that was a, a really interesting, I like it to be exciting dynamics. Um, now that I'm kind of a technical uh, person with pigments and coatings and restoration, I also um, like to make sure that um, all of that is complied with clean, cleaning the wall, making sure humidity doesn't go behind it. Um, I, I always think of durability and I'm thinking 50 year durability minimum to all of my murals and I'm applying the latest resins and graffiti guards, polarizing uh, materials as possible over the color. So I'm kind of a tech nut about that part. And of course the execution, as I'm getting older, it, it does get a little bit more complex for me because my cartilage and my knee and blah, blah. Um, but um, I, I've been able to surpass that. People help me now. They even set a little folding chair for me sometimes and place all the all the equipment that, that close so I don't have to go back up and down a lot of times to set up. I think I answered your question. All right. Thank you for walking us through your process, Victor. We all know that masters have their methods and so you've definitely enlightened us on how like you even come to about like creating that those murals that you do. We have an audi audience member question from um, Olivia. What advice do you have for people who are bicultural or come from diverse backgrounds, especially in a world where most find it easier to blend in? You know, I just saw something yesterday about, instead of thinking of themselves as two different cultures, I think, I think the answer was we're both, 100% of, of both things. I think it makes you, what I have been calling myself for the past 40 years is capirotada. Capirotada is bread pudding, and I think Ayushi knows, loves to eat capirotada, right? <laughs> and uh, it's a bread pudding that's a combination of nuts and bread, old bread. It's kind of interesting. The best capirotada is made with hard bread in a, People put peanuts and uh, piloncillo, which is brown sugar and stuff. It's, it's actually very delicious and very fattening, I guess. But because I kept on asking my family what I what where, who's the Indian? I always ask my grandparents, who's the Indian in our family? Because I'm taller and lighter. Everybody would say, oh, you have a grandfather that was German. You have a, another grandfather that was French. And, and I, I kind of got tired of, of getting that same response of who I was. And I wanted to know my indigenous part. And finally, when I met my great grandmother, who's Zapoteca, about four feet tall, <laughs> with little, little braids, and spoke Zapoteca and all that, I go, oh, there's the Indian right there. That's my great grandmother. That's my grandfather's mom. And I just love to go visit her. She would make me chocolate con molinillo with the baddest froth you could think of in, in the chocolate. And I just love to, to hang around with her. And uh, so that as soon as I could drive and, and went, I, I've been to every, every state of Mexico and I always hang around in the small pueblos and the indigenous people of my family from Sinaloa, all the way to Colima, Mexico City, Guanajuato, all, all over where I have my families. And uh, like my aunt in Mexico City says, asked my, call my mom when I first went to go visit her. He says, what does this guy eat? Do I have to make hamburgers for him? And, and uh, he said, no, it's this mas Mexicano. He's like so Mexican. Make them the food that you make you know, at home, you know, and she's the one that 
they made this nopal salad, this cactus salad for me with layers of cactus to me. Uh, it was very patriotic. It looked like the Mexican flag. Green cactus, white onions, red tomatoes, and then another layer of nopales, onions and tomatoes, and then panela cheese diced up, and then slices of avocado on the top of a big lasagna dish. Oh my God. <laughs> We still, we still, my daughter really, really knows how to make it. And our whole family is making that now that we call it Aztec uh, nopal salad. <laughs> That's so cool. I love nopales. We always have nopales for at least one meal of our day at home here. So I love, I love that. And very it's so healthy, cool. Very anti-viral. -vir <laughs> That's true. And I, I also love the like the jelliness of it, it's like very sticky. It's really cool. A lot of, a lot of young people don't, they go, I think even my son doesn't like that part of it. Uh, he's around here somewhere. Well, I love nopales. <laughs> and that was a great answer. Thank you, Olivia, for your question. Um, Hannah has a question, so let's send it over to her. Hannah, what's your question? Hi, Victor. Um, I'm wondering what the process is like for um, figuring out locations for your murals. Do people usually come to you or do you have um, dream places that you request um, permission to paint on or how does that work? Well, um, I'm very fortunate to be painting at Chicano Park for 50 years now in the one of the things that I value a lot about painting walls is that I don't get any censorship. In the at Chicano Park, it's never no, I've never gotten any censorship. They, they I paint I wanted to paint Che Guevara, and uh, nobody said, "Oh no, don't do that." Or even when I started painting skeletons in the early '70s, Mexicans would come off the freeway and say, "Oh." You shouldn't paint skeletons because the gringos are going to think that Mexicans are death-oriented or morbid or, or uh, you know, violent or something. I go, well, I was raised with, uh, you know, Day of the Dead altars from my grandma, and that was never the attitude. And so that was interesting that, that uh, they were questioning that. I think if the wall that somebody offers me, I have gotten walls offered, like in the one that I did in Belfast, they invited me to Belfast to Falls Road where the English do their Ku Klux Klan marches. So it was like a super important wall because they, those English were walk, marching, parading in front of it. So um, that's an important thing to, that it reaches, um, um, the population, not a hidden wall, like a lot of graffiti artists do, uh, ditches in in water, uh, you know, uh, you know, aqueducts and things uh, that, that hardly anybody sees. I, I do love the, the fact that things are seen by as many people, and I also love newspapers or TV that do pieces on the mural. It seems like it expands the audience. To many more thousands. So part of the media is part of the reaching out to more community. Um, I rarely do just commercial type murals. I don't, I, I've done like a fruteria where I, I designed the letters to look like fruits. It was Fruteria del Barrio and that was kind of a commercial thing but but it was right in the community and uh, they wanted me to put a, a, a one of those boards in the sidewalk to for the people could see from a distance from blocks away. So I it, I saw the you know the, the you know those boards that you put kind of triangular. I made it into a big uh, watermelon slice. So from from two or three blocks you could see a big watermelon, and I put seeds in it. Kind of looked like a Mexican flag also, and then I put this I put the lettering on there. Fruteria del Barrio, and everybody knew where that fruteria was because it, it had that big slice of watermelon. So, you know, even the most commercial part of the things that I do 
I always inject uh, something to do with my culture or my history or, you know, philosophy as well. Thank you, Victor. Uh, you made a great point where the medium is your message and you convey that message through what you put on that medium. So um, following up on that, is there a certain style or certain colors you gravitate towards um, with certain meaning and what are they? Yeah, colors are, are so amazing to me. Um, they all have different uh, significance. I know one that's very powerful is this sapphire that I'm using a lot. Uh, it's a purple, a purple color. Um, it's too bad we don't have like some a, a PowerPoint that I could resource to in this period, but I always call it passion purple because in describing the energy of different, like orange, I know I'm a Leo, so I'm a solar person that has like a fire, a fire energy, or the beans have kind of a mother earth uh, uh, connection to, to things that are natural. Um, the passion, passion purple almost has like an electric, symbol to me uh, has like a, like a lightning kind of a, a thing where love love and passion have this kind of electrical energy so i mean i've been painting for such a long time i have like so many different things you know like this jade color that my shirt is has this very pre-columbian symbol i painted walls in, in my house jade because it has you know, the Aztecs uh, thought of jade as more precious than gold. So when the Spaniards came, they gave them the gold, but they kept the jade. And people thought that was weird. That, oh, they're keeping the jade. You know? But when I went to China, they love jade like the Aztecs do. And I, I told them, my Chinese friends, I go, oh, it's interesting how you feel about jade is very similar to what, how I feel about jade. And so that whole Bering Straits history, the diaspora of people, of our people coming from Asia, kind of hooked up to that. I go, well, maybe that's why we love jade as well. So um, colors have so many different uh, things. And la lately, I've been painting with pearlescent paints, which even pump it up to to almost the spirit, the spiritual dimension. And I think it's because I'm getting older and I, my knowledge about death or awareness of death can be, you know, a little bit more on the top surface of my feelings in that. So, so this, I, I love things to be, have a spiritual energy to it. So even though it's purple, if I put the pearlescent sapphire on top of it with the translucency in it, it just seems like it really brings it out even more. So I love to do experimentations with, uh, with colors and uh, paints. That's really cool. And then the idea of like interconnectedness and globalization based on colors, that's, that's something that I've never thought about. So that point stuck with me. The, the sun, you know, the sun, when it hits the earth, you know, why do we have a red tomato and what energy happens to us physically with the red energy. So I, I've also studied the Egyptian uh, color he healing uh, knowledge that they would solarize themselves or diagnose their illnesses by the color of their fingernails, the, the wax of their ears, the, the color, the white of their eyes. So there's a cure physical uh, energy that uh, is very important. So, it you know what when you paint a kitchen, what color do you paint it? What what color affects your digestive system? And so you know, there's even that that uh, physical part to it to the colors. That's that's really cool. That's very interesting. I've never thought about it that way, but I will start to now. Uh, and then one last question before we have to come to a close. There's only seven minutes left. How did this happen? Um, but 
which Mexican figures do you draw inspiration from? You mentioned Cesar Chavez in your talk, but aside from that, who else inspires you to create these murals? You know, I, I look back at my, this last week, um, Facebook, <laughs> it's kind of interesting. If you see my Facebook, you see a lot of how I'm feeling. But Lázaro Cárdenas was uh, president of Mexico from uh, 1936 to 1940. And my grandfather always spoke of him because he's the one that expropriated uh, the oil from the United States. And so he kicked out Standard Oil from Mexico. And um, my grandfather loved him. He was kind of a, kind of had a Chicano attitude because he had to deal with the 30s in the United States. But Lázaro Cárdenas, of course, is, is very important. Benito Juárez, being Zapoteca, and my great-grandmother also Zapoteca, I always loved him, but the fact that he was the first indigenous president was very important to me in, in my history, and my every time I recount him uh, with pride, you know, I, I think he's a an important person that, that I seem to gravitate to. You know, there's contemporary uh, heroes, Lucio Cabañas and Guerrero that stood up for some of the government and police actions in Ayotzinapa, even before the 43, was a very important hero for me. And there, you know, there's contemporary ones that um, I, I love to, uh, and I've painted, you know, their images on there. Wow, that's that's very interesting. I know we don't have very much time, but if anybody else, um, anybody have any questions? The floor is open to ask a last question. This is taped. You said you know that. So yes. will you, uh, see this again. Be able to see it again. Definitely, yeah. We can. We will put it up on our YouTube page, and everyone can find it there. Hey Juan, well, good to see you down there. I, I haven't seen your image, but I've been working with the Kumeyaay people here since '71, and I actually make medicine bags. I started going to sweat lodges for the first time in the Hoya Reservation here, and uh, it was always funny to see how. The Kumi, I thought that Chicanos were Spaniards and that we were part of the Spanish oppression. And I remember some Hopi came over and they were making far, fry bread and drinking Cokes while my kids that I took were rolling corn tortillas with salt. And I go, shit, man, we're, we're, we're more Indian than you guys. I look at, we, we even eat, um, you know, very still, very indigenous. And, and then the other part that was like our mothers, we're, we're still in a matriarchal system in Mexico. Our mothers seem to be the center of our families and our communities. So I saw, you know, we have a, you know, more, the more I analyzed it, it was, I felt that we as Mexicans don't realize how indigenous we are. And uh, the Kumeyaay uh, people here, I work with James Luna and different artists from the res that, uh, you know, has kept that up, you know, and I, I uh, we really respect um, our, the land that we're living here in San Diego. In fact, we do, for those that don't know, we have more reservations in San Diego County than any other county in the United States. Hey! <laughs> De Ganyos and all these different names that people call themselves here in San Diego. Thank you so much for your words of wisdom, Victor. Everyone's very, very thankful for sharing all this, for you sh sharing all of this and answering our questions. Thank you all to those who asked us, asked Victor questions. Mm -hmm. um, we have um, Elizabeth's Q&A at 2 p.m. PST in about an hour. So if you want to watch her talk, there's a little message in the group chat. Also, Victor's Instagram is linked and I'm sure you can find him on Facebook as well. That's how I found him. So please, that's how he was, that's why he's our speaker today because I found him on Facebook and I was like, wow, this My man. My son is also Victor Ochoa, by the way. 
there you go. You'll we'll see, you know, he's a, <laughs> he's a DJ and he just started coming back too. You know, he's, he's back at Los Panchos uh, today too, I think. Uh, he told me. He, so he says everybody's, all the workers are wear, wearing masks, but the audience seemed to be in a party mode. I don't know. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> don't breathe on me. <laughs> you can find all of Victor's socials linked over there and go check him out. He's a very cool person. We will see you back here in about an hour for Elizabeth's talk. If you haven't watched it,